You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another fun episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. My name is Rob. Thank you for joining us for this episode, which is 989. As always, we appreciate you taking a few minutes out of your day to spend it with us. It means a lot to us. It does mean a lot to us. We're very grateful for your support, as always, and do appreciate when you take the time to leave us a review. So please leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or Apple Podcasts, iTunes. Whatever you use, please give us a review. It helps other awesome people like you find this great information. Today we're excited, or at least I am, Rob, as we are talking about one of my favorite things to do with drones, which is subject tracking. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there are limitations for subject tracking because you're supposed to always maintain line of sight with the drones, which can make flying quite difficult. So in our question today, we're kind of talking about the nuances of that. And I just want to remind everyone, for all of our members out there listening, the new subject tracking course is live on the site. It is a really fantastic class. It goes over the different flight maneuvers that you can perform. It also goes over basic exercises for learning how to subject track via FPV and via LOS. It's a very comprehensive course that covers the nuances of not only subject tracking, but also flying over water and how to maintain a professional environment when you are flying on other people's expensive toys. (laughs) Very important. There are rules about that, by the way. You don't ever want to be, you don't ever want to be the guy that shows up on the day-long boat ride and never brings water or anything to drink or eat on the boat. You're just like, you're a sucker. You're just a sucker, not a giver. You're a vampire. Nope. You'll be, (laughs) you won't be invited back. (laughs) You really won't. If you ever wonder why you never got invited back, that's why. That's right. (laughs) Well, uh, today's episode is brought to you by our good friends at Colorado Drone Chargers. Check out Colorado Drone Chargers. They actually just released a really cool portable charger that's in a case for the Inspire 2 and Matrice 200 batteries. I know DJI has a great uh, solution out there and Colorado Drone Chargers has really been the fabric of the industry since they've started. Make sure to check them out. Colorado Drone Chargers. Hi, my name is Jeremy Dixon. I'm a 107 operator for a videography company. I find that when I'm tracking a target in camera frame, I am able to maintain a deadlock on them if I'm using FPV. But as soon as I look away at the aircraft to make sure I'm not going to run into a power line, I tend to drift. So my question is, how do you both maintain line of sight and effectively track a target? Are you becoming more skilled at flicking your eyes upward at your drone while maintaining your focus on the camera? Or are you able to track your target just by looking at the orientation of your drone as you circle? Thank you. Hmm. Orientation of your drone as you circle. Thank you, Jeremy. That is a good question because subject tracking is uh, something that takes a lot of practice. And you've got something for us here. It is something that takes a a lot of practice. Um, This is actually a video. If you're watching the uh, YouTube feed, this is actually the video that I won the World Series of Surfing on. Um, Filmed in a gorgeous location. Some of these shots may not make sense to everyone. And I get it. Some of the people in these, uh, what is it called, in these videos really wanted to see like, you know, audience. They want to see people there doing the experience. And, you know, subject tracking is just kind of one important element of um, getting an overall production. A lot of these shots were actually taken with a super high speed camera. I love having a diversity of cameras to take with me whenever I'm doing a boat shoot. So this is one of the uh, most recent boat shoots I've done. I did another one with the new RI-257, which was a fantastic boat. But um, actually, this is a 20 minute long video. This is the wrong video. (laughs) Oh no. Here it is. Here's the one that uh, actually won it all. That was the 20 minute long version of the prose writing. Yeah, here's the actual one. So this is, uh, again, it's a lot of fun. So when it comes to filming wake surfing, you can see some of these shots right here. That's a drone shot, actually. These drone shots that are really low and close, this is what essentially gave me the competitive edge. The slow-mo shots are drone shots? Uh-huh, some of them are. I thought you were using that Sony. 
Uh, some of them are Sony, some of them are drone. Because I was using the Phantom at the time and shot everything in slow mo. I didn't uh. even take the Inspire with me because I don't think I had the X7 yet. So, um, and oh, again, nice. the Phantom is just one of those one of those drones that you can just get everything out of. Right, right. So anyway, he asked the question. You know, like here's a shot. We're going across the bow. That's a drone shot, by the way. Uh, that's not. That's not. You can tell by the color gamut in the sky, by the way. Oh. See how the, the blue changes? So that's ground. Hmm. That's gra- Oh, that's drone. <laughs> you can definitely yeah, tell the sky. Drone. Oh, there it is. Yep. That's drone. That's drone. That's drone. Drone. <laughs> see how I'm across <laughs> the wave? But see, these super low shots allow you to get a different perspective. Now, he asked a question. So I'm going to stop this really quick. I'm going to go back really fast. Again, if you are listening um, to the show, check this out on YouTube. So look, there I am in the boat on the top left of your screen. Looking at the screen, not the drone. Looking at the screen. Yes. So typically, whenever I do this, I have a visual observer. I make someone in the boat my visual observer or take someone with me typically. Like the last time we went, Hoel was my visual observer. Mm -hmm. Um, And what this does is he essentially, uh, you know, plays my eyes and ears while I'm staring at the screen. Looking for those power lines and things. Exactly. Yes. And there can, it's funny that you mentioned that because we did a subject tracking uh, training recently uh, with one of the military branches and there were power lines in places that we couldn't see on a map. So (laughs) that was kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, going back to this, there are a couple different ways to do this, Rob. I would recommend for everyone that you just have a visual observer, but it's extremely important that you guys set up a form of standardized communication. You know, if he says, hey, um, you need to move right, is that drone right or is that operator right? Mm. So what I always do is I always tell everyone, you have got to have communication that essentially, long and the short of it, is all about uh, focused around the drone. Like, we got to move drone right, drone left, forward, back, closer to the boat, further from the boat, descend, ascend. I know that that got under someone's skin a while ago when I said uh, (laughs) de-elevate and elevate. Uh, They're pretty much the same thing, so it is what it is. But that being said, I would say for most people, they need to have a visual observer there so they can really focus on flying uh, first person view. And this is why we have the subject tracking course, because it goes over a lot of the exercises, like the T drill, understanding how to frame your subject and match the frame so that the drone is matching the speed of the subject. There's a lot of um, really nuanced exercises that really, really help people kind of master FPV flight. Now, I will say in the beginning, I was definitely like looking up and looking in the screen, looking up, looking in the screen. Um, I will say I, a lot of people know me in the wake industry for flying super low and super close. Whenever I'm flying super low and super close, I'm typically looking at the drone. I'm not looking through the screen because I'm more concerned about the proximity of the drone to other things. Like they, they can't essentially be too close. Which so. can be a little bit difficult to gauge looking at the screen. Hundred percent, and yeah. also like if you have, let's say that uh, you're flying an Inspire Two X Seven, and you're flying, uh, like my favorite lens to fly is a sixteen millimeter lens because it's the widest. It also includes an ND filter, which some of the other ones do not. But whenever I'm shooting four K sixty, it always crops in, and I can't stand that. It's another reason I love the Phantom. It doesn't crop in at four K sixty. When it crops in, my total spatial awareness kind of gets screwed up. Yeah. But if you are afraid to fly close, maybe start out with the Inspire and a 24 or 35 millimeter lens because it's going to be harder to control. And if you learn on like on harder circumstances, you're going to become a better pilot over time. Now, obviously, one of the things I talk about in aviation and flight schools all the time is there's this level of risk versus your skill. And there cannot be too big of a differentiation mm. between that level of risk and your right. level of skill. You have to kind of build up slowly. Think, sure. think of it like a video game. You know, Mm -hmm. so again, in the beginning, I would be looking up at the drone, looking at my screen, looking up at the drone, looking at my screen. I've seen some people use those little glasses, you know, where it's like, um, what is it called? Uh, There's just like the Sony, the Epson. There's a bunch of different ones. I don't like those. I don't like them at all. Um, I actually recently talked to Bill about them and um, I said, you know, let's say I have an accident and I'm wearing these glasses or these goggles. Is that inhibiting my ability to seek and avoid? And he's like, yes, 100%. He's like, unless you can clearly see the drone and scan the sky, if you don't have a visual observer, that's a problem. But with those glasses, you can see the sky and visualize the drone. 
Yes. Mm, yeah. I, mean, I, I could see the argument. It goes both ways. It does go both ways, but I could see the argument of where it, it certainly until you get used to it, it could be more of a distraction than an aid in, in terms of safety. True. Because right? there's going to be a learning curve. But that's interesting that, that uh, that's the perspective that he had. Um, but I get it. I do too. Yeah. I do too. Also, just for me, like there are different glass manufacturers and the, the one that has just the one eye, I think is really cool. Mm -hmm. The one that has the two eyes, uh, no, no, thank you. Not for me. And even um, that, that's going to take a lot of getting used to. Yeah, and that's the thing is that I've learned by using a phone and staring at a screen and staring at a drone. And I've, you know, been doing this for a very long time now. And I think this is why I'm much smoother than a lot of other people, especially at high speeds. Yeah. Um, and it's my, you know, it's a gift, but it's something that this is like the perfect practice model, Rob. It's something you have got to level up. You've got to practice. You've got to create, you know, I started with simple video movements uh -huh. and then went to more complex ones. Yeah. And I think that one of the things obviously that pra that practice brings is, is the feel that goes along with the visualization, right? Because what Jeremy is talking about here in, in terms of looking at the screen and then looking at the drone and going back and forth. I would presume, I'm certainly not skilled enough to know this, but that at some point you have such a good feel for the control and, and what your fingers are doing with the sticks relative to where the drone is that this might be an exaggeration or an extreme way of saying it. It doesn't matter what you're looking at. Yeah. But to make a point, that's an extreme way of saying it, that if you look up instead of at the screen, your feel for the sticks is so good, you're going to be fine. Right. But it also takes a lot of like, l it takes a lot to really learn exactly. how to do that because when you stop looking at the screen and you start to look at the drone, many people's uh, essential orientation kind of gets messed up. So they hit the sticks and the drone moves in a way that they weren't expecting whatsoever. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of one of those things where you have to learn that once you go from the screen back to looking at the drone, you've got to make a mental note not to move your hands at all. This is another imperative reason why people need to fly in attitude mode or at least learn to fly in attitude mode. It's so critical. And this right. is why we have that patent pending drill that, you know, really goes over that. And, you know, I'm forever grateful to be able to go flying uh, in a helicopter with Bob Martin and you know he says you know hey for this is what we do for new helicopter pilots pilots well took that adapted it changed it and now we have a a drone drill and uh, unfortunately Bob is no longer with us so not with the company I mean he is he's no longer with anyone yeah so anyway long and the short of it is is that when it comes to flying uh, subject tracking, you've got to learn to really do both. Look at the drone and learn to not move your hands so that you can get these smooth motions because people mm -hmm. will be able to tell if your speed doesn't match the boat, you're not going to get a seamless, nice quality looking shots. Mm -hmm. So again, like, you know, this is one of those subjects that can really go deep quickly. And I would just recommend to everyone, you know, and this class is included for free for members. You know, most people come to drone you and they're like, oh, I want to get my part 107. It's like, well, that's great. We want to help you do and get your part 107 but it's so critical to understand that that is not the gateway to success. The gateway to success is learning, you know, how you operate under 107, right. getting your waivers, and then it's, you know, flying over water, and then it's getting your drills and exercise course, and then it's the don't crash course, and then it's the subject tracking course, and then maybe you want to learn cell tower mapping. Maybe you want to learn solar ins inspections. Maybe you want to learn other types of mapping. We got it all. We do have it all. One last thing I, I'd like to say to Jeremy, and and correct me if you don't agree with this, but I think you will, in that these things that you're experiencing and these struggles that you're having, they're very normal, right? Just it's because you don't have the experience yet. Yep. So the more you practice, you know, assuming you, you practice well, then you will overcome those things and, and you'll be uh, tracking things like crazy before you know it. But yeah, the things that you're describing, I think that's probably what everybody experiences when they're first starting to... To, to work with subject It tracking. takes years to. Sure. And I've heard a lot or, of people, and this is actually something I want to just mention really quickly, um, is that we, we've really seen a lot of people, um, you know, kind of go into... 
well, can I use active track? Can I do these things autonomously? And the answer is technically yes, you can do them autonomously. But the issue is, is that you never actually like gain the skills necessary to, uh, you know, like learn, okay, well, I need to articulate the drone a little bit better across the hood of this car. If you're working with active track all the time, you are not going to be familiar with how to essentially uh, utilize these things. This is actually um, part of the Don't Crash Course Active Track uh, video. And you can see here that uh, the Mavic 2 Pro is tracking me. But you can't really articulate the drone. You can do different modes where you can move across yourself, but you're just moving the stick one way or another. You're not learning how to articulate the sticks together in a combination to get better motion. You can see Active Track actually did a very good job yeah, of staying on me. Mm -hmm. We tried tricking it here. Let's see if we can go to it really fast. See, you can use that slider to go across your subject. See that? But again, you're not learning the keys to active track itself. Well, and these are things that anybody can do. Exactly. As opposed to sort of customizing and kind of creating your own version of how to do this stuff. That's right. That's right. So, but as you can see, active track is a is a useful tool, um, but it's not the end all be all. So I just want to let everyone know that you know it's not. It's not it. So, right. um, cool. so again, if you are looking to do some active track, uh, just understand that your motions are going to be very limited and you are not going to be building up um, a level of skill that's going to support long-term success. I think that's what I'm trying to say and say it succinctly. So. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Well, I think that's going to do it for us today. If you have a question, go to askdroneu.com and upload that question. Also, don't forget, if you already listened to episode 986, we reshot that episode um, with federal investigator Bill English from the NTSB to further go over the different types of accidents and what to do when you do have an accident, because it all depends on what happens in the accident and how you should handle it because of the way that the law is written. Like Rob... Did you know, this is really interesting, you crash a drone, all right? Okay. You hit a tree, mm -hmm. drone cost 15 grand, Ouch. and no one was hurt. Do you report it to anyone? Yes. No. <laughs> okay. Dang it, I had a 50-50 okay. chance. Okay. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. All right. Now, let's say you crash a drone, okay, and you cause someone a serious injury where they're in the hospital for 48 hours. Okay. Do you report that and do you preserve the evidence? Do you report that and do you preserve, I mean, I would say yes. The answer is yes, but the circumstances are so important. So make yeah. sure you check out episode 986. We're almost to a thousand episodes. It's crazy. I'm hoping that we can celebrate at the uh, Somos Unidos game. Jay. That would be awesome. That's what I'm trying to set up. That would be yeah. awesome. So let me work on that. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us today. Uh, New Mexico United. Woo! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to Ask a Drone You. Ask a Drone You.